Welcome to a brief summary on Allosaurus, the line of the Jurassic. Allosaurus is one of the most popular dinosaurs in the modern age. This is partly due to its early discovery, and also partly due to its eye-catching design. With its colourful crest and strong front arms, it's very different to many other dinosaurs in the spotlight. In today's video, we're going to be looking at Allosaurus's discovery, its appearance, its neighbours, and its other species. If you do enjoy the video at any point, please leave a like and subscribe, it's a very kind thing to do, but other than that, let's get into the video. The first official naming of Allosaurus occurred in 1877, because of a collection of fragmentary fossils in the Peabody Museum of Natural History. The fossils included three vertebrae, a rib fragment, a tooth, a toe bone, and some of the right humerus, and this is how Allosaurus got its official name. Its genus name comes from the Greek words Allos and Saurus, meaning different or strange for Allos, and reptile or lizard for Saurus, so together Allosaurus's name officially meant different lizard. But how did it gain its species name? Well, because of these fragmentary bones, Allosaurus received its species name of Fragilis, meaning fragile. If you know anything about Allosaurus, you might know it has quite a lot of species, four to be exact, with Europus, Fragilis, Chimpanzee, and Anax. But how did these other species get discovered? Well, Europus was discovered in 1988 during the construction of a warehouse, the skeleton of the theropod was discovered near a village of Andreas in Portugal, and this is how it gained its name, Europus, meaning European, showing it was a European Allosaur. There was also Allosaurus of Chimpanzee. This Allosaurus comes from 1991, a bit later down the line than the other two. This Allosaurus is known from a couple specimens, but the most famous of these being Big Owl. The remains of Big Owl are in extraordinary condition, with it being over 95% complete, making it the most complete Allosaurus ever discovered. This species was named Jimonseni to pay a mad paleontologist Madsen, who contributed to the taxonomy of Allosaurus greatly. And the final species of Allosaurus is Allosaurus anax, which means different lizard lord, with the last part of its name anax coming from the Greek word meaning lord or king. Originally, this was a completely different dinosaur, being classified as Saurophaganax. But due to somewhat recent research, Saurophaganax has been classified as a chimera, not an actual creature. And by chimera, I don't mean a mythical animal, but instead it was not one dinosaur, meaning some of Saurus' fossils belong to a large Allosaurus, now known as Allosaurus anax, and the rest belong to a sauropod. Allosaurus in appearance is a very cool looking dinosaur. Starting in its lower half, it had strong back legs made for high speeds of up to 25 miles an hour. On the head of Allosaurus, it had a strange appendage, that being its crest. Although for certain we don't know what this crest was used for, there is a couple possibilities, and the main idea, which is also the most likely, is the crest was used for display, either to intimidate rivals and predators, or used to attract a mate. Moving down through its impressive crest and onto its mouth, it had a rather lacklustre bite force, at only 3,500 newtons in strength, and for comparison, the African lion has a bite force of around 4,400, and the solar crocodile has a bite force of around 16,000. So sadly, Allosaurus did not have a very strong bite, but this is most likely because it used its arms for combat instead of its jaws. These arms would be very strong like you'd expect, but it's not the muscular arms which is the impressive part, it would be the claws. Each Allosaurus had three 7 inch long claws adorning the end of their hands. With these they could easily dismember or disembowel any target they wanted. Now we know the key features of Allosaurus, how big actually was it? And well, within the four species there's quite a bit of differentiation. Anax is the largest of the Allosaurids, measuring at 10.5 metres in length and 3.8 to 4.5 metric tons. Next on the scale is Fragilis, measuring at 9.7 metres in length and 2.3 to 2.7 metric tons. Europus on the other hand was actually a bit smaller, at 8 metres in length and 1.3 metric tons. Chibinsenia is the smallest, but it's also rather strange, since in size it's smaller at only 7 metres, but in weight it's 1.4 metric tons, making it heavier than Europus, but shorter in length. Although Allosaurus lived in two different places, those being Europe and North America, surprisingly it didn't change its environment, with it staying in the same arid shrublands in both environments. Allosaurus itself was rather fast, like I said earlier, so this would mean its hunting strategy would often be tiring out its prey, most likely, and for that it would need a large area to do so, and its two areas in North America and Europe were perfect for this. The lands of North America in the Morrison Formation would have been filled with plains, and then on the other side in Europe, the environment was actually pretty similar, with more sandy plains opposed to the dirt-filled plains of North America. But nonetheless, it would still give Allosaurus a great area to exhaust its prey from a chase. 
Allosaurus lived in very jam-packed terrains with tons of other dinosaurs. So to make this a bit more simple, we're going to break it down to the families they're found in, with the first being the Ornithischians. Of these, there's a total of 8 confirmed Ornithischians that Allosaurus shared its home with. First we'll go over the neo Ornithischian, of which there were 4, with those being Camptosaurus, Dryosaurus, Nanosaurus and Eutodon. The first two being Campto and Dryo could offer a nice hunting option for Allosaurus, since both are around 5 meters in length and 100 kilograms, so if Allosaurus could actually catch them, they would be a viable food option. The other two neo Ornithischians being Nanosaurus and Eutodon aren't as impressive in size, with them only being around 2 meters in length, so they could be a food option for Allosaurus, but since they are rather small, I don't see it very likely that Allosaurus would exert so much energy chasing after this tiny meal. As well as the neo Ornithischians, they were also the classic Jurassic Stegosaurids. The three Stegosaurids Allosaurus encountered were Alcovasaurus, Hesperosaurus, and Stegosaurus. Of these three, there's two smaller groups they're split into, one being called Dacentrione with Alcovasaurus, and the other being called Stegosaurinae with Stegosaurus and Hesperosaurus. In these two groups, there's actually a lot of differentiation. For example, Alcovasaurus sported a longer, more slender neck. This was probably due to the smaller size of Alcovasaurus when compared to the Stegosaurinase. Because of this smaller stature, it needed a longer neck to reach high vegetation, whereas the Stegosaurinase did not need this adaptation, because they were already tall enough to reach anyway. Another change between the species was the trademarked Stegosaurid plates. Alcovasaurus had a more slender and spiky plate, looking almost like spear tips, whereas Stegosaur and Hesperosaur had more rounded plates. The reasoning behind this is rather simple. Stegosaurinae were larger, meaning their plates went full display off the ground, making them eye-catching and useful to attract a mate. But Alcovasaurus was smaller, meaning when it was attacked, it was always from above, so having those spiky plates like a porcupine gives it another level of protection. Although these Stegosaurs could be viable options for Allosaurus, since the mass is around the same, and it definitely had no weapons to bring them down, these were not easy prey, like Dryo and Campto. All three of these dinos were equipped with several life-ending phagomizers on the end of their tails. One swipe could easily end the life of an Allosaurus by either breaking a bone or piercing a vital organ. On top of this, even if Allosaurus survived the initial attack from the phagomizer, the wound it would leave on Allosaurus would be so large the chance of infection would be near 100%. And the final on the fish gen Allosaurus shared its home with was Frutidens, which is a rather strange looking dinosaur. At only 70 centimeters in length, Frutidens was a tiny dinosaur. We don't really know much about Frutidens, but one thing we can know for certain is this was not a food option for Allosaurus, due to its tiny stature of 70 centimeters. As well as Ornithischians, there were also a lot of sauropods Allos shared its home with. To be exact, there were 17 different genus of sauropods, so to make this easier, I'll just go over the important ones. Surprisingly, Allosaurus would have hunted a lot of sauropods, due to it being an incredible generalist carnivore. To support this, we have a lot of Allosaurus bite and claw marks on many different sauropods, including ones that are much larger than itself, like Diplodocus and Apatosaurus, which for comparison, max out at 80 feet on Diplo, and 75 feet on a pato. The sauropods that were eaten by Allosaurus would be the smaller sauropods like Dystrophaeus, Suasia, Gelmorphus, Catadocus, and Haplocanthosaurus. Since these sauropods are small, with the biggest only ranging at 40 meters in length, I could see Allosaurus bringing these down easily. If we move up a size bracket to the sauropods like Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, and Brontosaurus, Allosaurus would still have a decent chance against them. Although they are large and may seem dangerous, that's what you've got to remember. Allosaurus' main hunting method is tiring out its prey, so with these large sauropods, it wouldn't be too much of a hassle to get them tired and make mistakes, which allows Allosaurus to get critical strikes. But there was one sauropod no Allosaurus could bring down, and that would be Brachiosaurus. Brachy doesn't only dwarf Allosaurus by 14 meters in length, it also dwarfs it in mass, weighing a staggering 5 times more than Allosaurus, of 46 metric tons. Circling back to the smaller sauropods, even though they would be hunted, they would not be easy game. Considering their size and weight, even a weakened attack from these sauropods, with a kick or even a tail whip, could potentially do lethal damage to an aloe, breaking a bone similar to that of Stegosaurus. So most likely, the small and young sauropods would be hunted over the fully grown adults. The last major dinosaur group it shared its home with was the theropods. The most likely competition from this family was probably from its own genus of Allosaurus, since the species of Anax, Fragilis, and Gemincenni all lived in the same area together. 
so most likely considering their sizes they'd be at odds with each other. As well as the Allosaurus, there was also Ceratosaurs, like Ceratosaurus and Phosphorovenator. I could see subadult and adolescent Allosaurs maybe having problems with these since they're in the same niche in size, but to adulthood I don't think these would be an issue at all and most likely would become prey. There were also many Calurosaurs inhabiting the lands of Allosaurus, but sadly this wasn't the Cretaceous, so Calurosaurs weren't the top dogs like they were in the Cretaceous. So these Calurosaurs inhabited low-lying niches as scavengers and small game hunters, offering no threat to Allosaurus, but the main competition besides of Allosaurs would have came from the Megalosaurids, of which there were two, one being the smaller Martrosaurus at 4 meters in length, and the larger one being Torbosaurus, the apex of the Jurassic. In a confrontation, Marshosaurus wouldn't do much to an adult Allosaurus and would end up in the same position as Cerato, but Torvosaurus on the other hand would beat a majority of the Allosaurus. Since it had a stronger bite force, it was larger in size, it outweighed it in mass, and it also had larger claws. But the only Allosaur that could compete with Torvosaurus would be Anax. But this fight would be very 50-50, because they're both relative in size and mass, with Torva being slightly heavier, but Allosaurus being slightly longer. And as well, they both acted similarly in combat, with them both primarily using their claws opposed to their bite. So in the most likely scenario, I think these two would probably just avoid each other, because they both knew they could end each other quite easily, and wouldn't want to chance any injuries. But with that, our video is concluded, and the brief summary of Allosaurus is finally complete. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and hope you also learned something new. If you did, make sure to drop a like and subscribe, it's a very kind thing to do. But other than that, hope you have a nice rest of your day, and I'll see you later. Bye bye.